Mangwana ni mwalele po vugenja ni vanave Africa. Welcome to this show that keeps you abreast of the latest happenings across our continent and beyond. My name is Aina Raiza Koyo alongside Diana Masta Moro. Good morning, Lady in Pink. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. I love the look. I love the pink. Thank you. It's giving very much um, Barbie doll. Thank you. I love it. But we're here to talk about serious topics. Yes. And dissect serious topics. So let's get into what you can expect in today's broadcast. Kenya to launch first ever operational satellite on the 10th of April. Sahel region, worst place for journalists in Africa right now, says a report. South Sudan's leader's passport recovered after 1993 crash. Adi Hohad will also fill us in on the news making headlines in South Africa. Stick around. We'll be back with our top stories right after this break. NMH at one brings you news from all across Namibia. If you would like to feature your brand or campaign on this platform, contact NMH1 at synergy.com.na. NMH at one, your lunchtime news companion. In our top story this morning, Kenya to launch a first ever operational satellite on the 10th of April. Now, Kenya will launch its first operational satellite next week in a landmark achievement for the country space program. The government said on Monday, Taifa 1 or Nation 1 in Swahili is scheduled to be launched the 10th of April abroad the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from the Vanderbilt Space Force Base in California. The mission is an important milestone. Defense Ministry and Kenya Space Agency said in a joint statement, adding that it would contribute significantly to the country's budding space economy. The observation satellite is fully designed and developed by Kenyan engineers and will be used to provide data on agriculture and food security, among other areas, the statement said. Testing and manufacturing of the parts were done in collaboration collaboration with a Bulgarian aerospace manufacturer, it added. Now, an East African economic powerhouse, Kenya, is suffering its worst drought in decades after five failed rain seasons. Getting into our next story, South Sudan's leader's passport recovered after 1993 crash. A Kenyan family on Sunday handed over a passport belonging to South Sudan President Salva Kiir, which got lost in a 1993 plane crash. The travel document had been safely kept by the family for 30 years, along with those belonging to other passengers who were on board the plane that crashed in Kenya's northwestern Baringo County. The family in Samu village had also collected President Kia's armlets from the scene of the accident. South Sudan Presidential Affairs Minister Banaba Benjamin led a delegation that received Mr. Kia's travel documents and armlets at a ceremony attended by villagers. At the time of the crash, Mr. Kia was the Chief of General Staff of the Sudan Sudan People's Liberation Army. On board the plane were five other people, including the pilot, Mr. Key's bodyguard, two Norwegian medics, and a British national who was said to have died on the spot. Villagers rescued survivors who were trapped in the debris and organized for their transportation to the hospital. As part of its appreciation, the South Sudan's government said it will build a modern hospital in the area, which will be named after President Key. The crash site will also be a part of South Sudan's heritage and will be transformed into a tourist attraction. Now in our next story, Sahel region is one of the worst places for journalists in Africa right now. Now, one of the worst places to work as a journalist in Africa is the Sahel region, where Islamic East extremists are gaining ground while military government take up civilian political spaces. The case of French reporter Olivia Dubois, who was released from captivity a fortnight ago after 711 days in Mali, cast a light on a, the grave situation. He was the first French journalist to be detained anywhere in the 
the world in the past decade. According to Sandy Bow, Maronga Reporters Without Borders, director for the Sub-Saharan Africa Bureau, no fewer than five journalists have been killed and six others have gone missing since 2013. The increase in attack by armed groups has steadily re reduced the space in which journalists can gather information and has weakened the means of communication, he said. In Chad, Burkina Faso and Mali, coups have resulted in paranoid junta leaders controlling the media and creating fertile ground for disinformation narratives. Pressure and patriotic directives from army juntas fostered the development of controlled media and a code of silence surrounding sensitive subjects. Moving from Ethiopia to Mozambique, a hidden death's second trial under preparation. A second trial in the case of Mozambique's largest ever financial scandal, known as the case of the hidden deaths, is approaching now that the adversarial phase of the investigation has concluded, according to judicial sources cited by the Maputo Daily Noticias. There are four accused in this case, including former finance minister Manuel Chang, the former governor of the Bank of Mozambique, Ernesto Gove, and two other members of the Central Bank's board. At the heart of the scandal, Scandal are illicit loans for over $2 billion from the banks Credit Suisse and VTB of Russia to three fraudulent security-linked companies, namely Pointicus, Ematum and Mozambique Assets Management. These loans granted in 2013 and 2014 were only possible because the government of the day under the then-president Armando Kutbuza issued guarantees covering 100% of the loans. The loan guarantees were entirely illegal since they smashed through the ceiling on loan guarantees laid down by the budget laws of 20. 2013 and 2014. Manuel Chang signed the guarantees while Gove and his fellow directors of the Bank of Mozambique authorized the contracting of the loans. Gove and the other central bank directors can be hauled before a Mozambican court without too much difficulty since they are in the, camp in the country. Chang, however, has been in South Africa police custody since December 2018. He was arrested at a Johannesburg airport while on his way to Dubai on the basis of an international warrant issued by the U.S. prosecuting authorities. In our next story, in Nigeria, gunmen have killed 12 people in four attacks. Now, at least four people were killed and several others injured or kidnapped in a spate of attacks in northeast and central Nigeria, police and officials said on Monday. Insecurity is a major concern in Africa's most populous country as a new president is set to be sworn in next month following an election disputed by the opposition. In northeast Eastern Adamawa State on Monday, unidentified gunmen stormed Dabna village in Hong District, resulting in the unfortunate murder of three persons. Now, local police spokesperson Suleiman Nguroye said, adding that homes were set ablaze. No group has claimed responsibility, although Boko Haram jihadists are known to launch occasional attacks in the area from their Sabisa forest enclave in neighboring Bono State. Also, on Monday, gunmen attacked communities in Ogenaigu in the Dekina district of central Kogi state, according to local authorities. The governor's spokesperson, Mohamud Onogu, said that local polit a local politician was killed while others were affected by this ugly and unfortunate attack. We close off our top stories in Libya, where Human Rights Watch to repeal a law on cybercrime. Human Rights Watch called on Monday to repeal a cybercrime law recently enacted in Libya and to release people detained under it, which undermines freedom of expression, according to a report by the NGO. The Libyan House of Representatives should repeal the anti-cybercrime law passed in September 2022, which restricts the freedoms of speech and expression, the human rights organization said in a statement. Libyans must be able to enjoy the freedom of expression, whether online or not, said Hanan Saleh, HRW, HRW researcher on Libya, quoted in the statement. It is not a good thing to trample on this right in the name of the fight against cybercrime, she said. On February 17, authorities in eastern Libya arrested a singer and social media influencer for allegedly violating this law and undermining public integrity and morals, according to HRW. 
The NGO called for the immediate release of those detained under this law for speaking out peacefully. Article 2 of the new legislation stipulates as one of the objectives of the text the defense of public order and morals without defining them while Libya remains very conservative, particularly on the place of women in society. In October 2021, the House of Representatives, the country's sole legislative authority since its election in 2014, approved the text but only adopted it a year later without consulting civic groups, experts in technologies or in cybercrime, HRW pointed out. After the break, we bring you news from South Africa with Ari Hohan. Stay with us. Namibia is on our grenzen, vertel wekeliks die stories van Namibiërs wat oor see of elders in die buitenland werk. Die program nooi jou om saam te reis na nieuwe bestemmings en meer oor ons mense, hun levens, talente, sienswijses en Namibiërs trots de wereldweie voetspoor te leer. Oog Namibia is on our grenzen op Netwerk TV, NTV, OneUp2.com en Republikeinse Facebookblad. Nou wees om een grense handel oor, uitreik, gesels, reis en wenke en soms toer ons na besiens waardighede in die land waar ons keir. Contact grense at synergy.com.na en vertel ons van nou wees wat jy oorsee ken of om jou reisprodukte te aktiveer. Nou wees om een grense, ons land oor al in die wereld. Now, South African Finance Minister Enoch Godongwana is in Parliament today to brief members on reasons why he awarded ESCOM an exemption from disclosing wasteful and irregular spending. Here to give us the full details, Ari Hohad. Good morning, Ari. Please take it away. Thank you. Yes, very good morning, Diana. Yes, uh, it is an important day uh, for uh, them in Parliament. It must be discussed and it's related to money uh, that must be accounted for. So. Uh, aware of the challenges of ESCOM, uh, what it entails is uh, exempt from the Public Finance Management Act. So that was gazetted, so that means that it's effective, but it's been going to be discussed today in Parliament. Then the DA, the Democratic Alliance, will the, uh, decide if they're going to take it to court. Um, in short, what it means, like, uh, for the next three years, they, um, ESCOM don't need to disclose in their financial statements, um, in, their, in their financial report, um, uh, disclosure in irregular, wasteful, um, expenditure or um, it is uh, also crime and irregular um, expenditure. So that is uh, important for South Africa to know that the money is being used in the right way and uh, it uh, put it into context for the previous financial years, irregular expenditure for ESCOM was 11.2 billion rand and fruitless and wasteful expenditure was 2.3 billion, crime was 2.2 billion. So that's a massive challenge for ESCOM. Um, so the question really is, um, if uh, how will corruption be managed if you need not to disclose information? So that is the big thing. Um, the former uh, CEO of ESCOM that stepped away now, Andre De Reiter, claimed that there's uh, stolen money every month is one billion South African rand every month. So that's a big statement that was made that must be still proven. But um, ESCOM is a challenge uh, for, for South African economy at the moment. All right. Now, Ari, we understand that the, the Nyanga to Langa section of the Central Railway line in Cape Town has been opened. Tell us about this. Yes, it seems like PRASA, the uh, passenger rail agency of South Africa, tried to improve in South Africa and also uh, not only in South Africa, but also um, up in Gauteng as well. Um, this is important line in Cape Town. It's the central line, um, so it's a 50 kilometer line. Um, mostly people needed to use taxis, but now the train um, service have been um, put up again at the cost of 422 million South African rand. It's not stopping at all the stations yet, but at least people can travel, and uh, so it's good news for the commuters. So just to put it into context, uh, it's mostly taxis that people use in Cape Town and South Africa. 70% of all people use taxis, and the rest use uh, train and buses. So um, good news for commuters in Cape Town. And uh, hopefully safety on the trains will be also addressed, uh, but at least uh, running, um, so that's good news. 
Keeping with um, what seems like good news for diesel users, the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy announced a 73 cent a litre cut in the diesel price as from today, but the petrol price will just marginally decrease by 1%. Let's get into the details. Yes, it's, it's marginal for the diesel users. I suppose um, it's got an effect on ESCOM as well. They use billions of rand of, of diesel, but it's the 73 cents uh, less. So they have other deals, I suppose, how they get their diesel um, uh, on, on wholesale while big in volumes. But uh, diesel down 73 cents. Uh, that's important news for people with diesel vehicles. Uh, petrol stay mostly the same, that 93 octane just one cent less and 59 or 95 octane is uh, two cents less. So um, what it uh, adds up to, diesel will cost you 20 rand and 89 cents a litre now, and petrol at 95 octane in, in Gauteng, 22 rand 97. And uh, the up and down is, like always, it's got to do with the crude oil price and also the strength and the weakness of the dollar. So at the moment, crude oil is below $80. That helped a lot, but the rand weakened quite a bit the few, last few months. So it's currently at 17.86 uh, South African rand to $1. All right, with the upcoming long weekend, many people are planning to visit a popular wine triangle. Tell us about this. Yes, uh, not, not to be confused by the Bermuda Triangle. It's the uh, Agulhas Triangle. Uh, there it is. It's uh, on the most southern point of, of Africa. Uh, right at the bottom there is the most southern point of Africa, Agulhas. Uh, the, the other two points are the corners of this uh, 13 wine uh, wineries in that region known for their Sauvignon Blanc but a very popular place for long weekends like coming up uh, for people to go down just a two hour drive two and a half hour drive all the way to the southern tip of Africa uh, they've got the Black Oyster Cash the, is the one uh, winery and also Strand, Strandfeld and Olivedale some well-known names uh, beautiful places to visit and uh, that uh, that will happen the Capetonians and people from upcountry will go to the Gullis region and have a good long weekend with the quality wine. Well, that sounds like Anna and I should definitely take a trip down there <laughs> so we can come and explore the 13 wineries. I mean, we would never run out of, out of options. Yeah, we? no, we <laughs> would have the best time of our lives. And we have free accommodation. <laughs> Ari will take us in, right, Ari? <laughs> And I'll, I'll, take, I'll show you a few more than the 13 in other regions as well. For sure. Awesome. <laughs> We're definitely looking forward to it. That was Adi Holhard giving us the latest news on the ground in South Africa. We'll now take a look at the weather forecast before we return with our economic news. In our economic news this morning, DR Congo currency drops amid war spending areas payment. Now, a falling local currency, salary areas payment and war spending have pushed up prices in impoverished Democratic Republic of Congo, leaving locals struggling to afford basics. Since the new year, the Congolese franc has depreciated about 15% against the US dollar, according to official figures and money changes are hitting the poorest hardest. Several people interviewed by AFP said that in some cases prices have risen much higher, doubling or more. 
Now moving over to Egypt, non-oil activity shrinks a 28th month as inflation soars. Egypt's non-oil private sector activity shrank for the 28th straight month in March as import and currency restrictions and rising inflation continue to hurt business, a survey showed on Tuesday. The S&P Global Egypt Purchasing Managers Index edged down to 46.7 in March from 46.9 in February, well below the 50.0 threshold that marks growth in activity. At 46.7 the headline PMI signaled a further solid deterioration in the performance of non-oil companies driven by steep falls in activity and new business volumes, S&P Global Economist David Owen said. That brings us to the end of our economic news. We'll now take a look at the sports package with Ari Hohad. Good day everyone, time for international sports news and starting off with golf news first and it is the news from the Masters, it's the Masters, uh, the first major of the year that will start on Thursday. Big excitement because all the top players in the world including the players from the Live Golf Breakaway League will play at the Masters this year. Number four seed in the world is Cameron Smith. He is playing at the in the Live Golf Tour and uh, he said that it's important for the Live, Do Live Golf players, uh, 18 of them that play in the tournament, to do well in the tournament. And that is uh, because there's uh, statements, statements made that uh, they don't play real golf. And the reason for that is uh, that they only play three rounds. Also that uh, they get guaranteed prize money and uh, it is a gunshot start. And it's just 48 players that play in the Live Golf Tournament every week or when they play. So it is the uh, tee of times that's not confirmed yet. It will also be interesting to see um, how many um, who will play together uh, in the uh, the Masters in the first round. Craig Norman, he is coordinating the Live Golf Initiative. He also said that uh, it is an uh, important tournament for his players. He said if one of the Live Golf players do win the tournament, all the other 17 will be around the 18th green on Sunday to celebrate the victory. So the tournament starts on Thursday and it finishes on Sunday. Also soccer news, um, it is from Manchester United in the English Premier League, um, news that Luke Shaw, he uh, confirmed to sign a new four-year deal for Manchester United and uh, he came over in 2014 from Southampton, so he's been at Manchester United a long time. He will now be at uh, Manchester United until June of 2027. Manchester United still fighting to stay in the top four or to get into the top four to play Champions League for the next, next season and uh, the next game will be on Wednesday when they play against Brentford that will be at home and also big game over the weekend on Saturday they play at home against Everton. At the moment they're fifth on the lock. Um, it is Newcastle that's got 50 points or three teams that's got 50 points. It's Newcastle 50 points after 27 games. Then Tottenham Hotspur 29 games they've played. They've got 50 points and then uh, Manchester United in fifth position on the English Premier League at the moment with 50 points after 27 games. Moving on to tennis news on international sports news um, and it is uh, Rafael Nadal that indicated or that uh, confirmed that he will not play in the Monte Carlo Masters that starts next week. That's a setback for him. He's uh, trying to get into shape, uh, into fitness again to play in the French Open later this year in Paris. Uh, but he pulled out because of a hip injury that's been battling, um, that's been troubling him since uh, January when he last played in the Australian Open. He's already 36 years old, uh, so he's been battling with quite a few injuries lately. And also it is uh, Carlos Alcaraz, the number two player in the world. He's also from Spain, like uh, Rafael Nadal. And he also indicated or confirmed that he will not play in the Monte Carlo Masters. He's also battling with a hand injury and apparently he's also got a back injury. He's number two in the world at the moment, trying to overtake Novak Djokovic again. Novak Djokovic is uh, currently the world number one. And closing of today's international sports news with rugby news, um, it is uh, the Bulls coach Jake White that uh, indicated that he's not sure yet uh, what team he will pick for Friday's Curry Cup game and that is against Griquas. Um, it was the Bulls that lost against Toulouse over the weekend. They knocked out of the European Championship. That means uh, the, their best team, so to speak, the URC team, they're not playing over the weekend. And uh, the Bulls team, uh, they've got two teams at the moment that play in different competitions. Uh, they've lost four games in a row. So um, there's a good indication that uh, Jake White might select his strongest team for Friday's night, Friday night's game, and that is in Pretoria at Loftus Fasfeld when the Bulls play against Greek Bus. That's international sports news for today. Hope you have a great sport day, and we talk again tomorrow. Goodbye. 
Ohole So Nice is an entertainment show brought to you by the youth for the youth. This is a dating show that allows individuals to participate and be their own true selves. If you would like to feature your brand or campaign on this platform, contact zone at synergy.com.na. This is still Africa. Good morning. If you're just joining us, let's take a look at the highlights from today's broadcast. Kenya to launch first ever operational satellite on 10 April. South Sudan's leader's passport recovered after 1993 crash. Sahel region worst place for journalists in Africa right now, according to a report. DR Congo currency drops amid war spending arrears payments. Those have been our stories. We thank you very much for watching Africa Good Morning today. Now, we do welcome your remarks regarding our show. You can post them on our Twitter and Facebook pages. Please be reminded that Africa Good Morning screens on DSTV Channel 285 as well as Go TV 94 and on our website, which is called One Up 2. On that note, it's all our love, all our light. Happy Wednesday. <laughs>